welcome to And So Much More. I am here with Miriam Dakin, and she is the manager of pastoral care with our ambulatory services service line. Um, how would you define ambulatory services? I feel like people are probably like, I don't know what, what that is. What is that? <laughs> what is that? It's anything outside the hospital, right? Okay. It's things that keep you hopefully at home, getting the care and recovering when that's possible or getting the care when recovery is no longer your primary goal. So okay. it's hospice, home health. Um, PACE is not part of ambulatory care, but it's part of what we, we still participate mm -hmm. in in pastoral care. And um, all of our CMG practices and um, okay. the whole world outside acute care. Yeah, that's actually really helpful. Um, so what we want to talk about today is as we're, we're in a theme called life transitions, and it's kind of this unspoken theme. So if you didn't know, that's okay. Um, but we want to talk about um, what it's like for parents and who, you know, obviously have their own parents who are now finding themselves taking care of their aging parents and, and what that looks like. And I never want to say what that weight feels like, but, but I also want to recognize the intense work that mm -hmm. that is and that that's an emotional impact. That's a mental impact. Um, in some cases it can be a physical impact. And so, um, I guess my question for you as we're digging in would be to just help us talk about what does support look like? What does care look like? Um, so that's where we're going to go today. But before we even jump in and get started, why don't you tell us a little bit about you, um, your role here at Centra? What is your What do your days look like here? <laughs> sure, sure. Well, I am a chaplain by training and by education and by practice. And um, part of my role is to be supporting people who are going through a lot of transitions in life and living in that land in between where you don't know yes. what's going on and you may have all kinds of challenges and pressures and stresses. Um, specifically, I work with a lot of people who are in the process of taking care of someone they, they love and they care about and are not always sure what, uh, what they need, yeah. what they, um, if they have the resources that they need, both um, emotionally, um, spiritually, financially. Um, so I also work with a team of chaplains who primarily work in hospice, but some are in PACE uh, as well. And we're, we're pro providing that care and support that says we recognize we see the difficulty of the care that is required yeah. when you are the one receiving the care as well as when you're the one providing that, yes. that care and support. Yes. Um, wow, that's, that's a lot. <laughs> Let me just recognize that <laughs> first. Um, and so you get to experience having these conversations with uh, both patients as well as their caregivers throughout your day. Um, what is what does that look like? Well, it's very individualized mm -hmm. because you go into one situation and I like to to let people know when you've met one, let's say it's in hospice, when mm -hmm. you've met one hospice patient in their family and, or their caregivers, you've met one hospice patient in their family or caregivers. It's yeah. individualized. So um, a lot of what it looks like is recognizing and normalizing this experience that people are having. Yeah. It is not easy to be in any of those roles, yeah. with, uh, whether you're the one receiving care or the, you're the one providing care. Mm -hmm. You feel a sense of responsibility. You feel the weight of somebody's life changing in ways maybe they did not want and mm. uh, that no one really wants. Yeah. Um, you see people losing that sense of independence and fighting against that, which is normal. That's what we do. And you see that own tug, your own tug, if you were pulled into so many different directions. How yeah. do you have the strength? How do you have the resources, the energy, um, the, the care for yourself that yeah. may go by the wayside? So that's sort of what it looks like is going in and hearing the stories and finding what's normal about them yeah, and normalizing it and saying, yeah, this, this is what tends to happen mm. with folks and helping people listen to themselves when you ask them questions that hopefully bring about their ability to name what their resources are wow. and, and or to help them connect to resources that maybe they haven't considered. Yeah. Sounds like uh, there's a lot of validation. Absolutely. Helping people 
feel seen. And I love that you said um, each situation is unique um, and, and probably on various stages of that transition. And so um, it's just, it's incredible to be able for you even like you're, you stand in the balance and you're carrying that weight with them for each moment you sit down and you have this conversation. Um, what are some things that you share with them? Well, we share what we see, right? We share that um, when somebody is is questioning themselves whether or not they have the ability to do what they're doing, mm -hmm. we can help them see that they actually are doing what they, what is needed. Yeah, you know, we tend to second guess ourselves when we're caring for it's somebody true. else. It's true. It's very true. Yeah, yeah. But if somebody else who can see that. Uh, not in comparing with any other person, mm -hmm. but with comparing it with the knowledge that we have of seeing it so many times repeated saying, yes, it's normal for you to have a day where you feel like doing nothing but cry. Mm. It's normal for you to have a day where you find that you're laughing with your loved one and that you are finding ways to reminisce with them. Yeah. It's normal if you find yourself feeling frustrated at times. It's normal when you are uncertain about your future or their future, yeah. that all of these things are within the realm of what happens when people are caring for other people. Okay. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some of the decisions that mm -hmm. have to be made when you are caring for a family member. And, um, and you know, I think it's got to be so incredibly tense <laughs> because you don't want to make a decision for someone. Um, in a lot of cases, you know, some people very young find themselves caring for their parents when they don't really have their own family or a support system yet, but they may be built for that. But when, when you're having these conversations that, again, are so different, um, how, how do you help them make those decisions? Like, it's time for a long-term care facility or it's time to start talking about advanced directives. Um, and then having those conversations while helping them maintain that dignity that you that you want for them sure. well you know we talk about in the world of advanced care planning conversations and advanced directives that it's always too soon to have the conversation until it's too late oh okay so by that we mean nobody really wants to talk about this with a lot of advance mm -hmm. um, notice but the sooner you start talking about the things that are important to you what you value, what you believe, what yeah. you hope for, what you're dreaming about, what your goals are, those can help give you guidance to say, would I choose this treatment option or would I choose this treatment option? Would I choose mm -hmm. this resource or would I choose this resource? So that you can sort of do your own work to to look at the benefits versus the burdens of your choices, mm -hmm. right? So you may choose to go into a facility because you know what it's going to cost your family for you not to do that. Yeah. Or you may choose to uh, forego a treatment, for example, if you think what you're hearing from your medical care teams that suggests that the benefits are not going to outweigh what it's going to cost you in terms mm. of your time or your energy or how you're going to feel in the process. Yeah. Wow. That's a lot. <laughs> that is a lot. It is a lot. <laughs> yeah. Do you find yourself sometimes just sitting quiet with them? Absolutely. The real work is going on with the caregiver. Yeah. And the, and the patient, if uh, the one receiving care, I should say. We are there supporting and facilitating, but we are not directing. Yeah. Right. So we're not the ones that would say, you need to do this. We're saying, these are some options available yes. to you. But we want to listen first to their story mm -hmm. to know how to help give voice to what we hear them saying is important to them. Wow. That's, that's very powerful. You're like this. Um, mediator for just for their own thoughts, you know, kind of like, here, let me help you pull out these things. Um, I imagine that that is so helpful in such a difficult time. Um, so mental health plays a very big piece here um, for both the patient and for the caregiver. And, um, and I'm just curious, how do you advise them in that situation when you see that there's a need 
they might need some additional support. It's time for them to go and unburden their thoughts and their emotions so that they can keep care and giving. Um, is that a conversation that you have often? And then what resources do you either point them to or provide? Um, in some of our, our work, um, we are specifically, we put a whole team of people in place. And okay. if you're in hospice, for example, you get uh, a physician, a nurse, a social worker, a chaplain, um, home health aides, and um, volunteers. And all of us are paying attention to the well-being of the caregiver, yeah. in addition to the person receiving the primary care. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we'll often check in with and say, how are you doing yes. with all that is going on? And what can we do to provide some, some support to you? Uh, we can encourage things that promote a sense of self-care mm -hmm. and a sense of well-being, always leaving it up to that person to yeah. choose uh, what That's is right. meaningful to them. For some people, it's, I just want to go take a walk oh, by myself yes. and not think about this for right now. Well, we can have a volunteer come and sit with your loved one while you go take that yes. walk, right? Or we may say, they may say, well, I just need to talk to somebody about where I sense uh, God is in all of this. Well, that's what our chaplains can help do, or we can mm -hmm. help provide connections to resources in the community with other local faith communities. Yeah, um, Our social workers are really great about providing some emotional support and um, if they're looking for resources that are connected to more formal mental health uh, opportunities, then we can help connect yeah. people. Wow, yeah. that's so yeah. such great information and so much information. Um, for those who are listening who are in that caregiving situation um, and they're like, I, I, I want that, I want to be a part of that, I want that for my loved one, are there next steps? What does that look like to step into this environment that you're explaining? Well, you know, it, if you are looking for a transition that is leading towards end of life, if that's mm -hmm. what we're, um, we're wanting to explore, it's a conversation with your loved ones to say, is this where we are? But it's also a conversation with your primary doctor or your specialist that has identified mm -hmm. that you have um, a disease process that is looking like it's trending that, that, that direction. Um, and then we can evaluate it and say, do you really meet the criteria yet? If you yeah. meet the criteria, then let's have a conversation about, is this the right time yeah. for you? Um, and, and we go from there to say, what are your goals? If yes. your goals are to pursue a, 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 one more treatment for a cure, it's a little too soon for us. Yeah. But if it's to, I want to be comfortable, I have some, I have some goals that I want to meet in this life that these symptoms that I'm having are preventing me from, from doing, mm -hmm. um, or sometimes it's a matter of uh, identifying, hey, my loved one is taking care of me and they need some support. It's time to at least explore it with us and say, is this the right time? Yeah, yeah, that's really good. Um, I didn't know I was gonna go this direction, but I'm just curious, um, do you ever get pushback from the caregiver? And they're kind of like, I'm not the patient, focus on the patient, <laughs> yes. which I mean, I don't know that. Yes. I, I don't think you know how you'll, re you'll react right. until you're in that situation. Um, but yeah, how do you navigate that? Uh, carefully, um, <laughs> <laughs> respectfully, uh -huh. honestly, because we, we certainly don't want to push something that it, somebody is not receptive to, yeah. but we want to keep gently inviting to, to reassure people um, that what we are, we're there not just for the person who's identified as the patient, we're yeah. there for the whole family and that's family as defined by the patient. So they yeah. don't have to be related by blood. If you're providing care for somebody and we're involved, we care for you as well. Yeah. If you let us. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, that's, that's really powerful. And I think it's also very applicable to, you mentioned those who maybe not quite ready to step into that long-term, um, I guess we'll call it end of life care. But, um, but all of these things that you're saying are such really wise nuggets for those who are, have the parent or grandparent or close friend or mentor that they're caring for, um, who does still have some treatment options. Um, caregiving is difficult <laughs> no matter where you are in the journey. And I think that's one of the things um, 
that I really wanted to um, to touch on. Like those who are who are listening, like there's so much validation for you here because what you're doing is hard, and um, and so keep going and maybe glean from some of this where we're talking about um, just saying it out loud, get some things out loud, talk about how you feel, think about what your options are, um, and then maybe reach out and see what resources are available. Um, Cause you just never know what, until you've asked. Um, someone told me once, don't ever say someone's no for them. <laughs> and it, so just ask, like inquire, what, right. how can I receive help? Um, Cause the help is out there. So um, is there anything else you wanted to share that I haven't asked about or? I think you've covered quite a lot um, and I echo, it is hard. Caregiving is hard. It is maybe one of the hardest things you'll ever do. Yeah. I will say that a lot of times if you've got the right support in place and you're a caregiver, when the journey of that person's life that you're caring for ends here, one of the greatest gifts that people often have is the ability to say, I didn't think I could do it, but I had support mm. and I was able to do it. Yeah. And that can make a whole lot of difference when you're grieving mm -hmm. to know that you did everything you could do. Yeah, You yeah. couldn't keep it ha from happening because that's not how life works, mm -hmm. but you could do everything you could do and you did a good job. Yeah. I love that. Thank you so much for just thank sharing you. your wisdom with us here today on And So Much More. And thank you all for joining us. We'll see you next time on And So Much More.